Okay. All right, here we go. I think we are live. So welcome everybody. I can see a bunch of people have joined on already. We're going to wait for a few more people to join us, but my name is Brett Hawk. Welcome to Fitter and Faster TV live. And uh, we've got a very special guest with us today, and I'm so excited about this. This is, uh, this is such a cool event, and I'm so grateful um, for our guest. But um, I am a two-time Olympic swimmer and a three-time Olympic coach. So I've been to five Olympics, so I, I feel pretty, pretty good talking with some elite athletes. This one, this one makes me nervous today. So, uh, so Carl, uh, Carl Lewis, listen, man, I, I really appreciate you being here with us. I'm going to do a quick introduction because I, I need to just, uh, I need to say this. I mean, you were voted uh, sportsman of the century by the International Olympic Committee. You were elected uh, World Athlete of the Century by the International Association of Athletic Federations. And you're also named Olympian of the Century by Sports Illustrated. Um, that's a pretty incredible resume right there. You're also a nine-time Olympic gold medalist. And I'm coming to you from Auburn, Alabama. You were born in Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, li listen, I uh, really appreciate you being with us today. Great. Thank you. Um, that's uh, and, and you know, the, the Olympics, that's that's the IOC is probably the biggest honor I've had. I think thinking about the entire history of the hundred years of the Olympics. So that, that was a big honor for me. Yeah. And, I, and I'm interested in that. Like, why do you think out of all the athletes and all the sports and all the people, why are you? And, and, and I, know <laughs> why. I know why, you know, from my point of view, but from your perspective, how did you get there? Honestly? Well, I think, um, and I thought about that a lot because if you think about it, it's every ethnicity, mm. um, every uh, country, male, female. They pick yeah. one person. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't always say I know exactly why, but I, I think the performance, the longevity, um, and I was able to, fortunately for me, because of all the people to help surround me, you know, I was able to get a little bit of Jesse Owens, who was a hero, a little bit of Al Order, who was a hero. Um, I was a part of changing the sport in terms of uh, the Olympic Games. When I came in, it was pure amateur. When we left, I was a big part of making it professional. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that and then also the Olympics changed from kind of a non TV event to a television event. So it, it, it was a lot of it was just being at the right place, at the right time and having having the courage to try to change and go with those times. Yeah, well, uh, that's incredible in, in terms of just being named the athlete of the century. Um, I, and I know it's not something that you aspire to as a young kid, but what are some of the things that you look back on when you were a kid that you, you know were just kind of in you from the get-go? Well, the interesting thing for me, I, I, I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I had an older brother who played professional soccer, another brother who was a, a very good high school track athlete, uh, my younger sister, as people know, made three Olympic teams, Carol, and then my parents. My parents were um, both athletes in college, uh, college graduates, uh, public school teachers, coaches, mentors. I mean, you, could, you couldn't have had a better environment to be successful. And I think the thing that drove me was I was a late bloomer. You know, you know a lot of people think, oh, he was always fast. Well, for me, it was very late. I, I didn't think I was going to be successful. So when I wasn't successful, I did have a lot of support to just keep going and focus on myself. And so the, the drive was there and the drive knowing that I wasn't as good as a lot of other kids, that I had to be perfect in my performance. So I worked on my technique when I wasn't very good and I was smaller and I spent the extra time, those things that I could control. And that was what went on because when I became started to become successful, I started to grow and the talent started to show that desire to be the absolute best I could be didn't change. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, I, I think you can pick up by the accent. I grew up in Australia and, um, and, and I represented Australia at the Olympics and in, in two Olympics in swimming. But um, I, I vivid, vividly remember watching you at home, sitting at home with my family and watching you compete. I mean, everybody wanted to be the fastest runner in the world. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're a swimmer or not, but, but everybody wanted to be Carl Lewis, um, even, even back home in Australia. Uh, it, it's just, 
you know, I never thought there'd be a world pandemic and I never thought that I'd be interviewing Carl Lewis either. So <laughs> two things are happening at the same, in the same time. In the same sentence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Those things are happening right now. So this is kind of one of those pinch yourself moments. But but I am, uh, I was a sprinter. I swam the 50 freestyle, which is the shortest event um, mm -hmm. in the pool. And, and that lasted 22 seconds. I mean, you ran for less than 10 seconds. I can't imagine the amount of um, precision that needs to go into a performance that lasts less than 10 seconds. You know, I had I had time. I felt like I felt like I was crammed for time in 22 seconds. But uh, in, in order to get the performance in, in less than 10 seconds, there's, there's a lot that goes into that, even though it's uh, like that. Right. Well, the thing about it is that what helped me was being a long jumper. I was a long jumper that sprinted. So um, there was more time there. So that kind of helped me slow the event down. Mm -hmm. And another thing, too, if you really stop and think about it, you know, my feet were touching the ground about four times a second. So when everything's that fast, even 10 seconds seems slow. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you have about 45 strides in that 10 seconds. But here's the thing. If you make a mistake in four strides, that could be the difference in the race of 45, only four or five. You make a mistake, four or five, that's it. If it's in the beginning, then you're running the whole race realizing you can't win it. Uh, so it, it is a challenge, but you have to do it just like swimming, just like the same thing. You have to train yourself to do it over and over. You cannot say, I'm going to run fast today because you had to learn how to run correctly first. Mm -hmm. Then do it over and over and over until you forgot how to do it. Running is like breathing because you do it so quickly. You mm -hmm. cannot think about it. So that's the thing. So once you get to that point where you've done it, you know, millions of times and millions of steps and, pr and practice over and over and over, if you dedicate to that, if you do it correctly, then it's, it's not as hard. It's just managing the training, managing uh, the crowd, the environment, um, hope nothing's going along and you understand this people don't realize that it's not just being in shape being ready being prepared but hope that your family's okay there's no outside problems you know your your significant other is good behind you there's there are all these factors that have to go into it and so i was probably as fortunate as anyone to have all of those come together even though i had all the drama of everything else on the outside yeah that's really interesting that you talk about that because i'm, I'm a big believer in in um the psychology of the performance as well. You must have been pretty good at compartmentalizing your life so that by the time you got to the starting uh, line, you were able to kind of release those things. Is that is that something that you recognize in yourself where you could compartmentalize certain things in your life? Well, you know, the, the thing about it, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy because I'm, my mother said something years ago um, when I was competing early in my career. She was like, man, you're just like a walrus. Water just runs off of you. Mm -hmm. Well, it did. I, I just was able to just like ignore things that were not affecting me at that moment. Um, I don't know what that came from. Maybe uh, being the kid that was bad, losing all the time. And then uh, everyone saying, haha, you're short, you're, you're slow and ignore it. I don't know. But here's the thing. It, it, it goes into your life, too, because then you get to a point where that's the way I am outside of life. So not almost have to train myself to to be more sensitive and open because of, you train yourself not to be. But um, I, w the way the way I did it, I guess the three steps was number one, obviously you train hard mm -hmm. and you try to eliminate the variables. So um, that was one by, by training and doing smart training. Number two, I created markers in practice. So if I was long jumping on a weekend, then I had an eight step long jump approach. And if I jumped a certain distance, then I knew that I was going to jump well that weekend. Mm -hmm. Or if I ran a great breakdown on Monday, I knew I was going to run fast on Friday or my starts were good on Tuesday. So I, that was probably the biggest factor that I just created all of these markers that gave me the confidence. So it wasn't like I feel great today. It was, oh, I jumped well on Tuesday or Wednesday. So I know I'm ready. And, and so that didn't really come by like thinking about it. It just kind of happened. Yeah. Um, Coach Telez, the way we trained, we trained on Tuesday. We jumped. We did this. We did that. And then it just I looked up and I when I jumped well on Tuesday, I jumped well on Saturday. So then it evolved. And then I used that to make sure that I said, if I've got a competition, I've got to have a great practice today. And mm -hmm. that practice sets my Saturday up. Wow. 
Do you feel like you revolutionized the sport in terms of the way that you did things in, in practice, especially? Because when, when I was growing up in the 80s, everybody did c certain things just one way. It was just work, 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 and recovery was not a very big part of training. You must have changed the game a little bit with the way that you were doing things in, in order to get the consistent performances that you wanted. Well, what, what happened, a lot of things I wasn't even aware of. Um, I know when I came to Houston, University of Houston with Coach Telez, <clears throat> my first two years I competed for the school and then I started with Santa Monica. Hmm. Well, I did not know that he had this plan of how to train a sprinter that he developed in the 60s and 70s. Hmm. And he had people he used, but they were not as fast. And then when I came, um, I kind of had the speed to try to see if this works. And it just so happened that we were fortunate that we were living in Houston. So he even went down to NASA and said, is this correct? Is this movement correct? I mean, went to physicists and people that could actually look at this stuff. And so I was kind of his test case of the ideas that he had. And some of it worked and some of it didn't. But he was constantly basing it on science. So I was kind of a scientific experiment to the ideas that he thought. And so by the time I got into the middle of my career, he had worked all this out and um, and then it was going unbeknownst to me. We weren't talking about this, but I was just listening and following. And the thing that I did when I trained and even I do with the athletes that I, I teach now is that I, I challenge every single thing he said. He said, stroke your arm that way. Why? Mm. Because it does this. And then I said, OK, explain it to me exactly, because I don't want to mess up three or four times. I want to do it right immediately. Mm. And of course, you never do. But that was my desire to to seek the perfection in what he was trying to do. So it, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't emotional. It was it was business. So uh, it's like anything. If you I tell the kid now that, look, if you want to to get um, have success, if you want to pass a test, you study. You don't go out and you just kind of wing it and then put your earphones on and you're going to pass the test. You take them off, you study, you you learn the information, and then you go in and you're successful. Well, it's the same thing here. I didn't go through things. I didn't psych myself up. I didn't use clapping. I didn't use music. I simply learned how to do it the, the exact way it was supposed to be done and then try to duplicate that in a meet. And that's what I think was the big difference. I, I really uh, embraced the science of what we were doing. Wow. So it just sounds like you're a student of the sport. You really, I mean, you know, you were a late developer, so you had to learn how to do things right in order to get better. And, right. then, and then you're asking your coach, you know, uh, why are we doing certain things? And then, and then apply those things to what, why he's telling you that you're doing them, right? Yeah. I, the thing is, is that when I was 17, I decided I wanted to jump 890. And when I decided that, uh, in my mind, clearly, I'd only jumped about 750. So I had a long way to go. So I, I felt like that was a perfect jump. I've got to have the perfect jump if I ever want to jump 890. So my process was was seeking perfection. And so if you look at the, the, the arc of my career, I wasn't really competing against the athletes, especially in the long jump per se. I was really co competing against perfection. I wanted to have the perfect approach. Um, I, it was unacceptable for me to foul. You do not foul. Unacceptable. You do not fall start. You do not guess the gun. You wait for the gun. You learn how to uh, you, you learn how to uh, react faster and learn how to do it correctly. But you don't you don't do anything where you're trying to guess. Everything was about perfection, correct, what was unacceptable and what we did. So in my entire career, I fall started one time. And that was totally my mistake. And I still don't I'm still mad to this day why I did that, because I said, wait for the gun. And, and learn how to do it. Or in the long jump, I hardly ever foul. You know, more than 60% of my wins was on the first jump. And so, because I said, if you have three jumps, you only allowed one. If you have six, you're allowed two. That was my rule. So you could not foul. So then I spent extra time learning, how does the wind affect you? Um, what, what's the stadium like? I'd go out early and I'd look at these things and, and I would jump far in the qualifying rounds or run fast in the first rounds to see what it felt like, not wait till the final. So because of that, I had to be in better shape. So I trained long jump and sprints together, not like one or the other during the week. Wow, that's incredible. But why were you so driven? Like, why did you, did you love to win or hate to lose? Which one did you, was uh, it the most? Yeah, I, I, I only hated to lose one 
against one person and I'll leave that alone. <laughs> I didn't want to lose to Larry Marks. Other than that, I was, you know, I, I worked my way through it. But um, I, I wanted to win. And a lot of motivation is the fact that when I was a teenager, I, I used to love sports, you know, all sports, professional sports. And in watching them, as I got older, I realized the difference in the NBA and the NFL in the United States and Major League Baseball and, and uh, hockey. These sports were professional sports. They were earning a living. And, and when I got old enough to realize that we're doing the same thing, we're global, we're going to the Olympics, we're doing all this stuff, and yet we can't have the same benefits. So part of the motivation to win was to create an environment where I could change that sport to make us a professional sport. That was a big, big part of my drive. Um, if, if that had nothing to do with it, then I would not have had as much drive to not only to win performance, to be the best I could be, and then know, um, not early, but realize uh, that I was going to be challenged because people didn't want us to be professional. Mm. So then when I realized that, what's the only thing they cannot control? They, they could try to talk about me. They could try to destroy me. They could try to disqualify me. But if they if I kept winning, they couldn't stop it. So that was an, another added motivation to win. And then I was able to have the talent to do the multiple events. So then if I said, if I can duplicate Jesse Owens, uh, who was a huge idol and someone I really admired, then that's something that hasn't been done in you know 60 years or so. So it, it was just it just kind of kept going. Well, first of all, I wanted to be successful. Then I did that. And then I said, we have to be professional. Well, to be professional, you have to get bigger so that they can listen. So now, how do you get bigger? You win. Well, you got to win the worlds. Now you can't win one or two. You have to win three or four. So, and then learn how to project yourself, go to the Grammys, meet people. Um, you know, these are, so it all became, because it just started off small. And then it's like, well, once I got something, I went NCAA. It's like, I want to win world. And once you win world, I want to be successful. Then I want to get rich. And then I want to be famous. <laughs> so it just kept, it just kept adding on. So by the time I got to like 88 or 84, I was famous. I was wealthy. Um, and then I became successful. But the one thing they, they, you know, of course, as we know that, you know, all these issues with all the things that happened. So therefore they took money because they fought me on amateurism. Uh, they attacked my, you know, my character and everything, but they couldn't stop the winning. No matter what they did, they had nothing to do with that. And that was a, a big driving factor. Yeah, honestly, um, you know, I remember the performances, uh, but I, I don't know enough about Carl Lewis. So I kind of got on the internet today for about four hours and I kind of went down a rabbit hole of your, your <laughs> life and your career. And, uh, and it was probably a bad idea because now I'm like totally intimidated by it by how uh by your greatness in, in terms of just um just the standard you held yourself to it was, it's really really impressive there's not many people like you carl and um and, and just what you did and how you did it. and the way that you wanted to change the sport i really could feel that like you wanted to change your sport for the better and and, and there were some people that um uh, really uh thought you know, it understood that. And there were some people that didn't understand what you were trying to do. But it was very clear to me that what you were trying to do was for the for the betterment of everybody. Did you ever get um, lured away in any way trying, you know, maybe to the NFL or, or any other sport? Did they try and pull you away from track and field? Well, the funny thing about it, I was drafted in the NBA and the NFL. Oh, wow. uh, I never never played football or basketball. I was a soccer player up through high school. Um, other than track and field. And the timing for that was good because when I was drafted in football, the, what I was making was at the top of the NFL at the time and basketball. It, it, so it, it, when track happened, there were so few people making a lot of money yeah. that I was making a lot of money back in 84 and 80 when I was drafted. So um, it's not now. Now, today, you, maybe there's a different thought process. Mm -hmm. But it's just that everything came together and the timing was correct for me to do what I was supposed to do at that time. Yeah. Um, five years later, it would have been different. You know, five years early, it would have definitely been different. And then I look at it 30 years later now with, with social media and the internet, that would be different. But I just don't think that I was the person that was supposed to be at this time. And so yeah. I, now that I'm older, I look back on that and I realize it's, it's you get frustrated because you say, gosh, boy, what if I was around now? Well, I look at Jesse Owens and say, well, what if I was around then? <laughs> so oh. it's all the same. You know, you never know because you have to make it for what it is now. And if you weren't here, how would it be now? Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I'm fascinated in this. Um, you know, you won nine gold medals, but 
everybody's good. You know, you line up against a lot of good guys. They're not slow. And every, and, you're, and you're talking about hundreds of seconds or you're talking about, you know, um, inches in, in uh, the long jump, things like that. So why were you so dominant? Like, you know, why do you think you were so – why were you able to get the better of your competitors when, it, when the margin is this big? Well, I, I think it started with the, the, the strive for perfection, it, and, and that's number one. I wanted to be perfect. I studied a lot. Um, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have the information, but I knew what every single competitor that I did going into each event was doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I had a strategy. Like I, I said, I ran fast in the qualifying rounds in the sprints. Well, part of the strategy – was if I ran fast today and I knew that um, everyone in a race came around, most people ran 10-3, 10-2, 10-1. There may be three 10, 10 zeros and maybe one nine nine guy. Well, I knew if I ran 10-1 in the first round or 10-0, then I just put 90% of the people to sleep. They said, oh, God, it's over. I can't win. Yeah. And then in the second round, I'd run 9-9, and now you're down to one guy. Yeah. And, and everyone else is – so I used to always have this thing, I guess – uh, two things. Number one, um, I, I always wanted to have free rent in their head. Mm -hmm. And I always, so if I, if I, if I performed well today and I'd go home and I count sheep, they go home and they count me. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't kind of a guy that tried to go in your face and psych you out. I wasn't that kind of person. I did it with performance. So I knew that in every single round, how fast the other people ran. And I'm like, I'm not going to lose a round or I'm not going to slow down. I'm going to put it, I'm going to pour it on. So there were, there were a lot of things. N number two, I, it, it didn't matter. I focused on the biggest events. And if you look at my performance, the long jump there, I lost races every year, but I knew I, I wanted to win the majors. I didn't want to lose on TV. <laughs> I, I didn't move <laughs> on TV very much. Yeah. And then I knew how to interview when I was on that TV. So mm -hmm. these are things that were all set up. And, and, um, you know, I, I went, I started 20 times in a world championships and Olympics and won 17. So um, the whole thing is that that was where the focus was because people don't ask me about, oh, you ran great in the Zurich meet, except maybe the people that were there that saw that great race. They just go and say you won nine gold medals. So I, I think that we get caught up in so many other things. And another thing is that I didn't compete a lot. I, I, I focused on those events. And I made sure I put myself in a situation where I wasn't chasing money, going to Europe and these places so that I could get paid. Um, I, I managed my money through my career very well. I always looked for the future. I didn't want to get broke in my life. <laughs> so yeah. um, I, I look at a time like right now and we're having this massive trouble mm. in, in a lot of sports because people are, are living on the edge financially. So here again, there may be a reboot, a reboot of should this many people be in our sport right now? Should we have 40% less so that we can actually pay the 60% that are still there are earning a, 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 a living? Yeah. Um, and so these are all the things that I was thinking about and that I articulate to the kids at University of Houston. You know, going through this process, they're understanding why I'm on top of them so much about getting their degree, no matter how good they are. So, so these are all the things I was thinking at like 19, 20, 21. When I went to the Grammy of the first time I wasn't there like in awe. I was in there doing work. I was going up to, to performers asking, you know, what should I do? And they were like, I heard about you. I wasn't big yet, but I heard about you. And then I'm like, well, what do you do? What's going on when you travel? How do you do it? Or said, I look, you know, they were giving me advice about makeup, appearances, interviews, all kind of, but I was always working because I, I realized I had to create something that wasn't there. Well, that's interesting that you caught on to that so quick because you know people understand that now, but it took someone like you to really kind of break that ground in terms of the charisma of an athlete and the way that you connect with the audience as well. And that's certainly something that popped off the television screen when I was watching you as a kid back in Australia, just the, the charisma that you had. Did you recognize you had, had that type of charisma as well? Well, it's so funny because I was extremely shy growing up. Wow. Um, even through high school, extremely shy. So I knew inside I had that personality, but I was afraid to show it. Mm. I, I just really was. Mm. So when I went to Houston, I actually took speech classes and did things to try to get out of my shyness so that I could present myself. And then I remember um, musicians and actors and things that I met told me how to project myself. I, I paid attention to everything, even down to the detail of when you finish your race, 
you, it's very rare you'll ever see me do an interview when I'm tired because I'm like, you're not going to see me do it. I'm going to run away, run to the crowd, do anything mm. and recover. So I'm not breathing hard and I'm thinking about what I'm talking about. Wow. So I, I made it uh, when I, when I did speech classes and I took these things, I, I took that and I applied it to track, to present myself. I mean, if you look back at it, um, I was doing branding before we knew what the word was. I was mm -hmm. metrosexual mm -hmm. before we knew what it was. All that stuff, you know, the dressing, the hair, the, that all came from entertainment, you know. And, and so it was important that my hair was right because I ended up with the flat top. Uh, I was one of the best dressed guys out there. Um, I presented myself. You know, all this stuff was things that I was studied and learned and knew that I had to do that to project myself so that I could uh, – get big enough in order to change our sport to become professional. So it was, it was um, the, the, the joy of running uh, when you saw, like I really seemed happy. That was not fake mm. because yeah. the thing is, is that I was just afraid to show it. And the joy came from the fact that I spent most of my career losing. And I spent 18 years of track and field pinching myself saying, you can't, I can't believe you did this because you were never supposed to be any good. And, and, and really, and so I never took the success for granted because I never thought it would happen. Wow. There's so much to unpack there. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been watching the, uh, the bulls, you know, the Chicago bull series and, and some of the things that you said there sounded a little bit like Dennis Rodman. He's probably somebody that looked at you, you know, he, he was kind of introverted as a yeah. kid and kind of came out of his shell a little bit. And, um, that, that's interesting. Some of the things you said there, but, uh, let, let's go to the performance themselves a little bit and we can talk a, a little bit technically here as well. Cause I'm interested in, in sprinting for sure. Um, how how did you want to be at the starting line? You know, five, ten seconds before the gun went off, what kind of physical state were you in at that point? Oh. Well, that's a good question because I, I know a lot of people, they they jump and do things and, and psych themselves. And I was the absolute opposite. I was all business, all technical. So what I would do is when everything went down, they said, come to your mark. Mm -hmm. If you go back and look at my races, I would go – get in the blocks. And then I would, <clears throat> I would sit up on my, uh, put my elbow on my knee and I would say, make sure you push out of the blocks, put your feet down, listen for the gun. I would just go through every single thing right there in that second, mm -hmm. because that was when I came into my lane, because I knew that if I did everything that I trained, did it correctly, I'd probably win. So mm -hmm. I never allowed myself to get outside of the track, outside of my lane. And that was it. It was all business. There was, it wasn't like um, any motion. When I lost a race, it was over. I say, dang, dang it. Where, where did I make the mistake? Or if I won the race, dang, why didn't I run faster? Um, so it, it wasn't personal. It was really about staying in my lane, doing what I was supposed to do. And 99 times out of 100, when I lost a race, I could, I could go right back and say, God dang it. I made that mistake at 20 meters at, out of the blocks. I didn't react. And it, it was so specific down to it. I know a lot of people try to react to the gun. They try to teach themselves to, to, to do things and react. Well, I did the opposite. I actually realized that when, at one time I was walking somewhere and, and I heard something and I tried to hear it. And I just kind of went silent, just like people do if something, a sound is a long way away. You make yourself silent and you try to hear it. And it just dawned on me. I said, well, God, I heard that sound so much better when I just calmed down and stop trying to listen for it and just try to hear it. Mm. And that's what I used at the start. And so I always had a very good reaction time. Mm. So it was things I was always analyzing everything in the environment or what I was doing, trying to see how I could apply that to what I could do to make it better. And then at the starting line, I always went over it. When I was the long jump runway, same thing. You know, if you go back and see me at the, at the runway, you can probably see my mouth moving because I'm telling myself, push out of the back, put your feet down. Last three steps, stroke your arms. It's always technical. So you were working things like visualization and self-talk back then, right? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, I remember, the, for instance, in the long jump, the last, the third jump in Atlanta, when I was in the qualifying round and I was in 15th place, and if I didn't qualify, I was out. I remember clearly saying, look, you're at the line. You know you can qualify. Uh, push out of the back, do all the things I said. But then the last thing I told myself is, do you know if you don't qualify, then eight gold medals 
are going to be run out the door because they're going to say he's too old. He should have stayed here. He shouldn't have come back. They're going to do all of that. They're going to tear you up. So how do you want to be remembered? So even sometimes that, and I, I, the last thing I said is, how do you want to be remembered? The one that flamed out or the one that fought to the end? And so, wow. and then Man, when I did that, put, I went back. Put some pressure on yourself. Oh, right back. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and when, and then when I did it, it was, it was, um, I knew I could do it. It was relief. It was like, wow, okay, we got this out of the way. But five minutes later, I said, oh, I'm going to win this damn thing tomorrow because I knew that I was in their heads. God dang it, he did it again. He's in the final. And so I went to sleep saying, if you do that tomorrow, you win. So that was, that was, it was always a little variable, but the basics were there. And I put pressure on myself all the time. But then I always felt like the pressure wasn't to like, I hope you win. The pressure was, if you do this, 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 you'll probably win. Wow. I was talking to Gail Devers the other day. I was very fortunate to talk to her and what an exceptional athlete she is as mm -hmm. well. Um, and she was telling me that, you know, in track and field, you know, you have your warm ups, obviously, and, and people were doing some sprints in warm ups. And she would see things like, wow, you know, they, they would do some incredible things in the warm up, but they couldn't bring it to the track when they needed it the most, when it was at the right. when, when the lights were brightest. Did you get that as well on the men's side? Was there was there people like that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I, the thing that got me were all of the, what I call idiot drills. People go out and they do all these drills and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, really all you have to do is warm up, stretch a little bit and run fast. <laughs> so yeah. I would see all of that and they got, they had this long ritual. And, and then of course, when you jog around and you, you, they see you and they see your confidence, you can feel that that's it too. But I, I, I totally agree with Gail. They went through all this stuff mm. and then they get right in a race and they don't accomplish the simple things. So it's like um, when I'm training kids, I tell them, look, there are probably a hundred things you have to do correct, but you can't do 78 before you do 32. So they'll do all these hundred things and then go out and mess up 15 and the race is shot. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, we tried it. Once you learn that hundred, then I try to break it down to like four so that that's the focus. But what's happening, so many people, they still have this hundred. They warm up with a hundred. They do everything with, and it's all this stuff. And it's like, you're just creating all this, what I call kerflama, that's confusion and drama, um, to just try to go out and perform when you really need to be bringing it down to something simple. Yeah. 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 Well, it looks, I can, I can relate. Cause I, I kind of feel introverted too. I grew up introverted. I was very quiet as a kid. And then, but I love to perform on a big stage in front of people as well, not to your level. I, I never got to there, but, um, but I did like to perform in front of a crowd. Um, is that something that, that you know, what, what was it about the crowd that brought out the best in you? What, why did you love that environment? Well, a couple of things. I remember um, back in 1980, I went to my first European meet, um, first or second, it was in Rome. And they had like 60,000 people there. Of course, I'd never seen that for a track meet. Mm. So when I saw that, uh, there were two things. Number one, I realized they all paid to get in. So someone's getting that. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the second part of it is, you know, with my parents being youth coaches and being in their environment all the time, I, I saw the family, the parents who were sitting in the stands cheering for their children. I saw the kids that competed that I competed with. Mm -hmm. um, I competed against some of them. They beat me. Sometimes I beat them. <clears throat> so I saw that. So I really understood what people felt in the stands. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. <clears throat> I remember seeing like my friends, sisters and brothers just cheering and crying when their kids went across the line. I remembered that. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I saw people in the stands cheering, they were like in the beginning, especially they were kind of like the friends and family and parents of the kids that I knew. And so I looked at them that way and I respected that they took the time to pay to come, to come to the event and the emotion that it brought to them because I, I lived it growing up. And yeah. when you're, when you're a, a child of parents that start a track club and then run it, and then they're also teachers and you're in the same school, you're in that environment all the time. I, mean, I spent probably, uh, well, actually physically, I spent uh, all the time because I was always in one of my parents' school and they were the coaches of the track team. So that's kind of what I did. So I spent probably 95% of my, my life with my parents there. Mm. And, and so it, it was a, it was a family thing that I felt. I felt a family connection with the crowd and I loved it. Mm. And that's why what they watch a lot of time, I spent so much time 
with the crowd. I even had in my contract some time that I had extra time after the race to, to spend time because I just I really felt a connection. Wow, that's awesome. Great. Uh, I love that. Uh, uh, tell me this. I'm going to ask a, a technical question. In, in swimming, I know the answer to this in swimming, and, it's, and, and I got it from track and field, but when you guys run, you seem to be relaxed in the face. Why is it that you relax? Rather than grit your teeth and bear down, why is it that you're relaxed in the face? Well, what happens, we always had something we called fast and relax. You, you, you stay relaxed so the muscles can contract and, and go back and forth. That's really what it is. When you, when you, when you grit, you tighten up and, mm -hmm. and the muscles contract. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, it's probably the same thing in swimming. Yeah. Um, but okay. you have to be, the thing is, if you're running efficiently, then you can be relaxed. But if you're not efficient, then you have to work harder. And what's going on now, especially with kids now, they're not learning how to run efficiently younger. It's getting worse. And a lot of that is because we've taken physical education out of schools and we have sometimes teachers or the football coach or someone coaching that doesn't have the background. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, once you're efficient, it's just in, in the way I describe it is that when you skip a rock on water, mm -hmm. when it hits that water the first time and it skips, it is beautiful. And just think if every single time that that rock hits the water, it's the first skip. Mm -hmm. And it's just it just hits it and it's so soft and it just skips off of it. That's when you're running fast, your foot is coming right down below you, your arm is opening and swinging in the correct way. So, so since you're not using the extra effort, everything is pushing, you can stay relaxed. But it's when you start pulling and, and trying to get faster and, and that's when you start to tighten up. Mm, I love that and analogy. What, yeah, and that's what happened a lot in my races. I knew a lot of people would, would tighten up because they tried to do too much too early. And so that's why I didn't worry when they, I got behind. I was like, okay, they're coming back. <laughs> you know, so so and, even and in the hundred, it's not um, it's not the person that increases their speed; it's the person that decelerates. Would you say it's the person that when? manages the race? Yeah, yeah. Because the thing is that the human be human body can only run full speed for about ten meters. Okay. So even in a hundred meters, <clears throat> you're really the winner is managing the ninety percent. Mm-hmm. Not. Not the fastest. I mean, the absolute fastest. Yes, you're faster. It's easier. But if you can't manage, if you go out too hard, then you're going to die at the end and your 90 percent may come too early and then you can't manage the deceleration. Mm -hmm. So you have to you really have to manage the race. And so what I did is I accelerated to about 60 meters and that's where I hit my top speed, 60 to 70. And then I was able to maintain that um, 70 the last 30 meters. Well, what if you hit full speed at 50 meters? Now you have 40 meters to maintain or mm -hmm. some kids even earlier. Mm -hmm. They get way out. And it's like, God, he just died. Well, he died because they're, you're going to decelerate faster than, you're, than you can accelerate. So therefore, once you start dying, you can't stop. It's just going to get worse. Every step, it gets more and more and more. Yeah, so the two big factors for us in swimming uh, that we talk about are distance per stroke, which I guess is distance per stride for you. Yes. And, and tempo, same same type of thing, right? But yeah, and, and the thing about it is that it's even though you're in the water, it's still the same thing. It's about um, putting your hand or foot in the right position yep. and then pushing. Mm -hmm. Everything's pushing. Um, it's, it's not... Uh, when you every stroke, it's it's how your hand goes in and then puts it in the right position for us. It's your, your leg cycles around and put your foot on the ground in the right position. And then the way you push, because if, if it's in front of you, it's obviously you're stopping for a split second. It has to hit right on the ground under you. And I'm, I'm assuming swimming, if your hand if, if your hand is in a wrong position when it touches the water, it's going to it's going to create some force. And if you don't cup your hand a certain way, then it's going it's not going to be able to push as well. So right. that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to pull back here. I'm going to show you something. So, in um, in in freestyle, I swam freestyle. And when I was watching you today in slow motion, it was it was beautiful. By the way, it was just poetry. So, but in freestyle, you want you want opposite. You want you want balance. So when when one hand is down here, you want the other hand up. And and, and right. when I was watching you in track and field, you had beautiful balance in your stride and your and your arms. Is that something that you you worked on? Yes, it is. And it's funny you talked about the arms because the when you're sprinting and running, the arms do not work together. Your your right arm works with your left leg mm -hmm. and, and the other. So so therefore, when your your arm goes like you're doing it, when your arm goes here, mm -hmm. it goes. And when it goes back, it actually opens up 
And when it gets down to the bottom, your, your hand is, your arm is almost completely straight at the bottom. Yeah. And then it closes again at the back. Well, it has to close because it catches on that shoulder joint and it sinks back, but it, it opens up going down, but it comes back closed because you're, you're, you want your, when it's, when it's coming up in the front, that's when you're pushing off the ground. And then when you, when your arm goes back, it's on the ground. So you want it to, to open up. So it takes more time and it gives your leg more time to push, but then you want it to cycle through and come down to hit the ground again. That's why it comes back shorter. So it's, it's kind of weird to teach, that your arms are doing different things, but you have yeah. to teach the kids to think actually your arm is working with the other leg. Yeah. And a lot of times in swimming, uh, and I'm sure it's similar in track and field, I think you can answer this for me. We, we think arms and legs a lot, but really in swimming, the, the hips play a major role in terms of connection and, and core, obviously core connection and stability. Uh, you know, head position. I know this, your, your head never came out of position. Right. It was always fixed. And it's exactly the same thing in swimming. You want to be going forward. You don't want up and down movement. You don't yes. want side and side movement. And, I, and I'm sure it was exactly the same for you, right? Well, it is the same because if, if you if your chin, for instance, goes up just um, one inch, mm -hmm. then every action creates a reaction. So if your chin goes up, then that means your center of gravity changes forward a little bit. So therefore, you have to move your shoulders forward. Mm -hmm. So if your shoulders are forward, then your legs can't cycle the same way. And they can't cycle, so your arms change. So it's just a simple thing like drop kids come in doing that because they're trying to reach to mm -hmm. get a stride. And so a lot of times I'll tell them, just drop your chin and get your shoulders tall because sprinting is, is tall. You want it because if you're tall, you can push down and you have the room for your leg to cycle. But a lot of ones want to stay down and push. They want to stay low, but you can't run fast staying low. So you want you want to like you said you want to get tall and open up like you're talking with your arms well that's what you want with your legs you want your legs to, to be you want to be tall enough so they have room to hit the ground under you and really cycle all the way and push so it, it's they're all it's basically it's all movement that was not invented recently it was it's just the same movement that they had all along and it's based on a cycle I mean, a bicycle is, is developed that way because that's the most efficient way in a cycle, and you want to run the same way as, as well. Yeah. Some of the hardest swims I ever had, even though it was just 50 meters, just one lap, were the ones where I was trying to get to the wall. And some of the easiest swims I ever had were ones where I just swam through the wall. And I talked to Gail Devers about this a little bit too. Was that similar for you where, where you wanted to run through the line rather than to the line? Well, it's an, an interesting way I thought about it. I, I used to accelerate, hit full speed, and then let the line come to me. Mm. So, so I tell everyone, just keep stroking your arms, putting your feet down, stay relaxed, and let it come to you. Um, because if you try to get to the line, that's when you press. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, it's just stay, it, it's, it's like shifting a car into that high gear at the end. You know, kids don't, we don't have gears anymore you know everything's automatic yeah. but when you go you get forth and then you ship and it just kind of sits in so that's kind of what when you get to that full speed and you can't downshift to fourth because look what happens to a car it it, it, it revs high and it slows down mm -hmm. it's just, you have to shift into that gear at the last at the end and just stay there and you can't change it the biggest thing in sprinting is your arms it's just like just like swimming your legs follow your arms so if your arms start dropping and they get shorter your legs do 100 um, percent and, and so you have to you have to stay in that position. But the hardest thing is for anyone is to get to that to, to finish that full speed, which is only about four or five strides and then maintain that and just maintain stroke the arms and maintain. That's the hardest part about sprinting. How tall are you? Um, I am probably right under six three now i think i shrunk it like a quarter of an inch wow, six, three. <laughs> that's that's tall for a sprinter right like you know yeah, yeah. Like most of the sprinters that you think of are a little shorter and stockier and a little bit more bulky in terms of musculature but did you see that as an advantage or disadvantage for you well you know there's a there's an american football coach that said something and i use it all the time he said big people beat little people <laughs> so um if you if, if you're taller it doesn't mean you have to be faster but you have an advantage you know i mean i i was six three tommy smith is six three you know bolts taller he's i think he's six four um john carlos is six three bob beeman was six three i mean uh -huh. these guys mike powell is, is like six two 
So if you really look at it, there are a lot more smaller sprinters because there are a lot more smaller guys. I mean, the average male height, I think, is five, nine and a half or something. So it's not a matter of that they're better. It's a matter of that's just the law of the land that you're going to have a lot more guys that are under six feet because there are a lot more guys under six feet. You know? yeah, yeah. But, but the records, if you look at the 100 record, the 200 record, um, Calvin Smith had it, the 100 for a minute. But if you really break it down, um, uh, Jim Hines was six feet, over six feet. Tommy Smith is six, four. He's taller than me. And then I got the records and I'm six, three. Leroy Burrell is six feet. Mm. And then uh, Donovan Bailey is six feet. And then guess what? Uh, Bolt and Bolt is six, four. So if you really look at the, the history, the mm. long, and even Jesse Owens are six feet. So the history of these events have always been, the records have been always tall people. And then you have an occasional smaller guy in there, but then Boom, the taller guy's got it back. Yeah. Tell me this. What was the fastest you ever felt? Like, you, I'm sure you can remember it. I can remember the day that I felt faster in the water than I'd ever felt ever in my life. And, and it's vivid in my memory. What is the day for you where you felt like you were just untouchable that day? You were just gliding. Um, the, the best race I ever ran was the 1984 uh, Olympic Trials 100-meter final. Mm. Um, that and it's on YouTube. I look at that race right now and I just cringe because I, my start reaction was perfect. I pushed, I came up. Um, and then at 40 meters, I was in the lead. I looked over and I said, oh, okay, I got this. And then ran a little bit, then looked over at 90, raised my hands, went mm -hmm. through. I mean, just easy, the easiest race I've ever seen. 10, yeah. 10 06 mm. into a negative 2.6 win. Oh, wow. So, it was just that was a nine eight race back in 1984. So the, I never ran a race better than that. Tokyo was obviously an extremely uh, that was a good race where I just did it. But that that race, the Olympic trials in 1984 was was it. That was it. That was the race. That was the best of any event, long jump race, anything that I ever did. Wow, that's awesome. Could you feel the difference between a nine nine zero and a, and a ten flat? Um, most of the time, mo most, I mean, sometimes I'd run really fast and I say, Oh my God, I didn't think it, but when, 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 if I won a race, even if it was a qualifying and, and I felt really relaxed, that was it. Cause most of the fastest races are the most relaxed races. Yeah. So it was easy for me to, to figure that out. So I said, Oh, that was, that was fast. Cause I felt good. So, you know, getting down to nine, eight, nine, 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 ten flat, it's kind of hard there. But I knew the race was um, 10 or better or nine, nine. I knew a nine, nine race. I could feel it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm the same way. I could, I could feel hundreds of seconds and people are like, there's no no way. But you, you can feel yep, it. You can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the hardest uh hardest performance you had to pull out of yourself the, the time where you were really down and, and you just didn't have it in you but you you found a way to pull it out do you remember that moment oh yeah absolutely the 1992 olympic trials long jump because i i didn't know at the time but i had a sinus infection and so i just wasn't there and something and something was going on and i didn't know what was happening i, I was sixth in 100 and fourth in the 200 or something like that and um I was dehydrated and I'm like, what is going on? I had no idea. And, and mind you, I'm 31 at this time. Mm -hmm. So I got up to the long jump and I said, well, I didn't make the hundred. I didn't make the, the uh, 200 and I got to make this long jump. So I gutted that out and still got a 28 foot jump. Just to tell you, I was sixth place in the Olympic trials hundred. And I think it was fourth in the 200. And I still jumped 28 feet in the long jump. It just tells you, you know, where, where, where the relationship is. And I, I gutted that out and made the team. And of course I went on to, to be successful, but I would say that was the one where I just had to do it. You know, my mind was like, this has to be done because I was in my thirties. And at that time that was uncharted waters in my events. So I didn't know, maybe I just didn't have it. Maybe it's over. Maybe I'm old. You know, I, I didn't know. So I gutted it out, found out about the infection and by the Olympic games, I was back to myself. Wow, that's incredible. Now, in order to get consistency in, in racing, you obviously have to have consistency in practice. Was, this, was that a standard you held yourself to, a very, very high level of practice as well? 
Oh, yes. We, we had a extremely high quality of practice. Um, one thing that I don't think people realize what happened is I started back in 1979 at Houston. Mm-hmm. And we, with Coach Telez, the best coach ever. I don't, you know, people can say it, but I said, I really believe that. And then it went to a point where when I, when I moved to the next level, Santa Monica, I was kind of training with the same kids, same college kids. So I went out and I recruited, um, helped recruit college with the university, Leroy Burrell, um, Kirk Baptiste, Joe Deloach, Floyd Hurd, and, and Mark Witherspoon, um, Mike Marsh, I recruited them to come train there. And these are all guys that ran nine, 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 19 sevens. And because I knew that every practice had to be like a meet if I wanted to get better. So I, I think that was the one thing that we all did. And I know that I deliberately did was I wanted the absolute fastest people in the world to practice every single day. Mm. Um, I didn't feel like, well, I can't train against my competitors. I was the opposite. I want number one through five in the world, on that line every day. So I know what Saturday is going to be like. Mm. And that's what Santa Monica was. I mean, I remember in 1991, we had five of the eight finalists at our championships. So and five of 10, top 10 in the world. And so the way we trained was extremely high quality. We, we didn't train long. Monday would be a 400, 300, 200. But when we were down in the season, we'd run a 46 two 46, three, come back in 31, nine into 200 and run 20.3 in practice. Wow. Um, with, with a 10 to 15 minute rest, that's it. Um, and a lot of other people would run maybe two 400s and two 300s and two 200s or whatever, or just one fifties, but we wouldn't do it. When we ran one fifties, we ran 15s or 14s. Um, and, and that's just the way it was. It was high quality. We, we had a repeat work at 200 workout, give you an example that we ran six 200s with a 75 second rest in 23 seconds. Oof. So, so yeah, and, and I can't tell you how much it hurt, but <laughs> <laughs> it was indescribable. Yeah. But when you have Leroy Burrell, who at the time had broken the world record and, and Floyd Hurd had run 19.8 and Mike Marsh had run 19.7, when you had these guys out there, it's like, you know, I, I got to do this. And, yeah. and so I, that, I think that th- there's no way I would have had the longevity or would have run as fast without those guys training every single day it was impossible it would never have happened is there one guy that just bought out the best in you where you were like oh, no you know you're not beating me like is this is there just one guy well well it was a it's kind of interesting how that evolved um i guess the best would be leroy burrell yeah. because leroy actually broke the world record mm-hmm. and i know it because i was in the race <laughs> so um so he he was the one that I would say on the team that brought out the best um, competition wise because he ran the fastest, but Mike Marsh was the best practice guy of all of us. No question. Uh, Floyd Hurd was worked extremely hard. Uh, Mark Witherspoon was the best starter in practice. So everyone had their thing, but I would say in competition, um, Leroy Burrell without question, because he was the one that actually broke the world record. He was number one in the world. And he did that stuff in the, the core event because the 200 was kind of like my third event. Yeah, yeah. The in the hundred was my second event. So um that and then of course if you look at the other um in competition wise, it was you know Mike Powell after after ninety one because he he broke the world record, he was number one. Yeah. So then it was like, well, yeah, I'm good. I lost, so it's good. The ten years over. Now um my focus was can I win the Olympics in ninety two? And then of course ninety six I stayed around, which I originally did not intend to. Did you guys do uh, one practice a day? And the, the next part of that question, did you run fast in practice every day? Um, yes, we ran one practice a day. Uh-huh. Um, we didn't lift a lot of weights. Later in my career, I did lift a little bit um, towards the end. And then we'd have a morning practice in the afternoon. But during the season, we really didn't lift. Um, and in practice, just to give you an example, to answer your question, for the most part, yes. Because Monday, um, we ran the breakdown. Now. To say 46, 31, 20 point is not fast, but to us, that we ran that workout for endurance, but also to slow the tempo down. That was our slow day, mm-hmm. Monday, because we ran, we ran slower because of the distance was longer. Tuesday, we took starts. I did approaches. Wednesday, we'd come back and do like 150s. But there was a time during the season we did 200s, which 
slowed us down again. So the quality of the practice was good, but the tempo varied from day to day based on the workout, not the effort. The effort was like 95% every practice. Did you ever think to yourself, I'm, I'm trying to do too much, you know, be, be the long jumper, be, be the 100 guy, be the 200 guy. Was there ever a moment where you're like, you're looking at your competitors and, and they're focused on a singular event, but you've got all this other stuff? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And I don't know how people have asked that. And I guess the best way to answer that is uh, everything was in totality. I had to do the four. And and when I decided in 81 to try to go for it in 84, mm-hmm. it was a three year process. Well, at the time I was, I was way ahead in the hundred, way ahead in the long jump and right at the top in the 200. So it became much more of a challenge later. Now, would I have been a better long jumper if I just focused on a long jump? I think so. I think I would have jumped farther. Would I have been a better hundred guy if I just ran a hundred and 200? I think so. But um, there's no doubt that the long jump helped my spring. So t- with taking the long jumping out, would, would I have actually been run faster? Because it, that did help. And taking the sprints out of, out of the, the long jump, would, that have, would I have had the same speed on the runway? So it, I guess if you have to look at it two ways, I think it went together. But we're in a different time. Because back in the 80s, we ran four rounds of everything. Mm-hmm. And y- you just did what you did. And so we didn't think about that. Now... Um, to give you an example, we ran the 200, two, two races one day, a day off, and then two races in the final. Well, now they run a race, a race, a day off, a race. We ran three and four and three days. They run three yeah. and four days. Yeah. So, and then the 100 meters, they don't, the guys don't run the first round, the top one. So they run three rounds of the 100 meters. So we ran four. So, so it's, just, it's, just, it's just easier now. And I totally agree it should be that way. I wish it was in our day, but we did we we did things different. Kids are different now. You tell kids four rounds in two days, they'll look at you like you're you're crazy. They, oh, we can't do that. Yeah. Because kids because kids don't they're not growing up being challenged that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you are you a tough coach? Are you, are you well, what kind of coach are you? You think? Well, I, I'm I'm I pick up a lot of stuff from Coach Telez. I try to think of it as a teacher, and so. Um, I basically there's one way to do it. Correct. Let's try to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, The biggest challenge I have now with, with especially the way kids are and and we can't blame kids. We have to blame the parents and the kids and it's society is that they just don't challenge themselves to be perfect anymore Mm -hmm. because we've created an environment, which I call a culture of mediocrity. Mm -hmm. Well, where it's just okay to win the prize, not the performance. And so you have kids that, uh, if you could say I could win 10 flat and win the 100 meters, win the Olympics, or I could win, run 990 and lose. Well, uh, every single time I ask a kid that question, they're like, oh, I want to run 10 flat and win. And then the second question was, well, what did, who won the race? It was 999. Well, guess what? If you had really focused on 990, you would have won both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of how I am. And, and, um, when I, I want the kids to think. So whenever there's a race, there's a specific plan like like I did with Coach Telez. And when a race is over, the first thing I always ask them, what did you think of your race? And I want them to analyze it. And then we could say, boom, there's a mistake. Just to give you an example, Mario Burke um, used to try to lean when he first came in here. So his freshman year, he went to World Juniors and he ended up third, but he got out and he was going and racing, racing, racing. And then at the end, he kind of stumbled and not stumbled, but he kind of leaned and ended up getting third. Well, I was in on vacation in, in um, Dominican Republic and he was in Poland. So I, he sent me the video. I watched it. And then I called him. I said, well, what did you think you did with your race? And he's like, I don't know. I thought it was out. And I said, your arms, bam. Oh, my God, my arms dropped. <laughs> and I said, your, yes, your arms dropped because you were ahead and you were trying to get to the finish line. And he's like, yeah, I thought, see, the whole thing is that I use my advantages of knowing every single aspect of every race. So what I've done is I've taken every good race, every bad race, and I put it in my memory banks. And so when I watch each race, I see the mistake a kid makes. Then I can go back and say, what was I thinking at that time? And then by the time I ask them, what were you thinking? I can say, well, this is what really happened. And it makes sense. So I'm trying to project 
um, what? So if Mario had just kept his arms tall, then he would have won that race. But but we focused on the mistake. So now it's like I got to keep my arms tall instead of man. It was a great race. You, next year you're going to win. It was third. It wasn't about that. Yeah. It was about well, here's a mistake, and you would have you would have done it. Well, so that's that. And so I I think that we pushed them. Now some kids think you push too hard because they're not used to striving for perfection. Mm -hmm. They're used to just saying, well, I just want to win. And I said, yeah, but you can't control winning. There's no one on earth can control winning at anything. You can only control your performance. So that's where we focus our energy. Mm, yeah. Well said. Beautiful. Um, listen, I can't, I can't tell you how um, thrilling this has been for me. Um, just before we go, we've, we've been about an hour here, so I really, really appreciate your time. This is awesome. Well, what can we help promote for you? Because, you know, I, I, I'm so val I'm so thankful for, for you giving us the time. Well, where are you at? What are you doing right now? And, and what can we help promote? Okay. Well, a few things. Number one, um, as you know, I, I said, I teach and coach at the University of Houston, mm -hmm. H-Town Speed City. So, um, yeah. we, we're really excited about what's going on with the program. I've got, got some, you know, Cameron Burrell and Elijah Hall and Mario Burke. They were there. Um, we have some new kids coming in um, uh, that that will be successful. So just follow that. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I'm, I'm, I, I have this new um, uh, app that I'm working with, organization named Rebel Labs. So we have, we're working on our app to come out, physical fitness and exercise. And because I'm really high tech, I love technology. Mm -hmm. um, Coach Telez is having his, his first real book coming out. I'm really excited about that. Um, it's, it's the scientific art of sprinting. Mm. Um, we're working on, it'll be out this year. So yeah. I'm really looking, so we can actually show the science. And then another thing too, I'm going to be talking about it more. I decided back in September that I'd gotten so out of shape. One of the athletes tapped me on my stomach mm. and said, Carl, what's that about? So I looked at it and I'd let myself go. Mm -hmm. So since September 9th, I've actually lost 30 pounds. Oh, wow. I'm riding um, over 100 kilometers a week on my bike. Mm. I, I, and, and I started lifting again. I want to I want to do a personal best in the bench press because next year I'll be 60. So uh -huh. my personal best, my personal best in the um, bench press uh, is 295 right now. I want to beat that on my 60th birthday. Wow. So I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm just doing it. And, and you know, the, the, the virus is such a challenge to all of us. And mm -hmm. what I really want to say it's, we're going to get through it. I think that um, the big thing is that follow your gut, your guts telling you that um, if you, if, if you uh, watch yourself, use your masking, wash your hands, um, socially distance, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what our silly president's doing is crazy. <laughs> Focus on what's smart to care about other people. My mother's 90 years old. I don't see her that much because I don't want to somehow infect her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a time when we have to stop talking about our rights and talk about our togetherness. And so that's my thing. Hang in there. Um, I haven't had a time, this time off in over 40 years. So I, I'm, I'm just trying to make the best of it. I'm not complaining about it. It's funny how every day is like yesterday. <laughs> but um, I, I just I, and, I, and I do want to say one you know, one last thing. I think we talk about how we um, care about our the people that are caring for us and and all the first the front liners and, and all that. But I, I also want to give a shout out to all the workers. I mean, it is scary out there when you don't have your job. You don't know when it's coming back. Um, and, and then sometimes they're trying to force you to work, but you're afraid to work because you've got kids, you've got families. So I, I just think we should think more about the ones that are hurting. I'm OK. You know, I'm in a position where it's great. But I think every day about the, the people that lost their jobs and and everyone talking about getting sports back on TV. Well, I'm, I'm just as concerned about the concession stand person mm. that those sports go, not just the millionaires and the billionaires and things. So I think let's think about others. It's a time that I think the world's being reset to not be selfish, to be thoughtful. And I just hope that we can all do that. That's a great message. I, I appreciate that. That's very powerful. And, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree on that. So thank you. Listen, um, this has been an absolute pleasure. I can't tell you how many times I pretended I was Carl Lewis, even though I wasn't running <laughs> as, as fast, but I'd always race my buddies down the street and, and, and at the end, you know, finish line and always pretend I was Carl Lewis. So, um, this is, this is very cool for me. So thank you for talking sprinting with me. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your, your life story as well a little bit and, um, and, and stay healthy out there. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, I had a great time. The hour flew by. So thanks and call back anytime. I did. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, Carl. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.